Okay, so pathophysiology of acute decompensated heart failure and how this can guide new treatments and which. So as we've already heard, acute decompensated uh, heart failure is a, it's characterised by patient heterogeneity and shouldn't be viewed as a single disease entity but rather as a multifaceted disorder with different clinical presentations and the main one being hypertension or normotension. And we've discussed these, the vascular failure, the cardiac failure and the differences in those presentations already. The pathophysiology of acutely decompensated heart failure is not well characterised, but as you can see from this diagram, it is complex. And what I want you to really focus on today are these issues. So fluid redistribution to the lungs and lung congestion, renal changes and renal dysfunction, cardiac dysfunction, and also neurohormonal activation. So acute decompensated heart failure syndromes are characterised by severe hemodynamic and neurohormonal abnormalities that may cause myocardial injury and or renal dysfunction or may be the result of it. Fluid redistribution, that should be there, goes on to cause congestion. Cardiac dysfunction goes on to cause myocardial injury. Renal impairment causes the, uh, goes on to cause the cardiorenal syndrome, and this is all on a background of neurohormonal changes. So looking at fluid redistribution and congestion, high LV diastolic pressure resulting in pulmonary and systemic congestion with or without low cardiac output is the main reason for presentation in the majority of patients. And pulmonary congestion can be defined as pulmonary venous hypertension with an increased PCWP, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, resulting in pulmonary interstitial and alveolar edema. As we've discussed, there are multiple precipitants of congestion. And this, uh, and most patients who come in with heart failure, acutely decompensated heart failure, are wet. So this is from the ADHERE registry, so any dyspnea is 90%, and pulmonary congestion, rails, and peripheral edema are predominant parts of the presentation. Looking now to cardiac dysfunction, myocardial injury, troponin release often occurs in acutely decompensated heart failure and it reflects myocardial injury. The injury may be the consequence of a high LV diastolic pressure, maybe due to hemodynamic changes, further activation of neurohormones and or inotropic stimulation resulting in a supply and demand mismatch in which there's increased myocardial oxygen demand and decreased coronary perfusion. And these conditions may precipitate injury, particularly in patients with coronary artery disease who often have hibernating and or ischemic myocardium. And this has been termed the perfect storm of myocardial, for myocardial injury, which is a very dramatic term. So we have chronic heart failure here with LV remodeling, neurohormonal abnormalities and myocardium at risk on a background of coronary artery disease with ischemia, endothelial dysfunction, stunned or hibernating myocardium, and then we have acute heart failure syndrome with all of the pathophysiological changes there and results in myocardial injury. And what we know is that uh, with each hospitalisation there is myocardial and or renal damage and that leads to further progression of the disease and this is evidenced by the risk of death increasing substantially with each subsequent heart failure hospitalisation. So what we have here is median survival and it drops off with each hospitalisation. So looking now to renal impairment in ADHF, renal abnormalities promote sodium and water retention. Structural renal dysfunction can be due to diabetes, hypertension, arteriosclerosis, and it's really common. Worsening renal function is seen in 20 to 30% of patients during hospitalisation. And further neurohormonal and hemodynamic abnormalities may be preventable or reversible. So as an ex to demonstrate this, we have so intrinsic renal disease with diabetes, hypertension, arteriosclerosis. We have vasomotor nephropathy with decreased cardiac output and or systemic vasodilation, high renal venous pressures, neurohormonal activation, and high dose loop diuretic therapy. They all come together to cause the renal, cardiorenal syndrome, which is worsening of renal function during hospitalization in spite of clinical improvement in response to therapy for heart failure and adequate intravascular volume. This is again from the ADHERE registry and demonstrates that impaired or elevated um, serum creatinine is, is really the norm when it comes to uh, patients with presenting with acute heart failure. 
And we know that patients with higher creatinines have a higher level of in-hospital mortality and that baseline renal dysfunction and worsening renal function are additive in predicting mortality in heart failure patients. And lastly, we have the neurohormonal changes, and they are many and varied. So we have renin, angiotensin, aldosterone activation, sympathetic nervous system alterations, including higher circulating norepinephrine, which correlates with severity of cardiac dysfunction and mortality, arginine vasopressin, which is associated with heart failure severity, but it's difficult to measure, endothelin-1, which has vasoconstriction and sodium retention properties, and adrenomedullin, which is a peptide hormone with hypotensive, naturetic, and inotropic effects. So as we've already discussed, the current management, which has been the same for the last 40 years, is listed here. Basically, you optimise volume status, blood pressure, restrict uh, sodium intake, uh, avoid things that will worsen the heart failure and consider inotropes or ultrafiltration. And this cartoon really demonstrates all the different ways that we can attack it. Uh, Guideline-based management in the, in the acute situation and what we know is from the ADHERE registry is that diuretics are commonly used in 88% of cases, vasodilators 21% and inotropes in about 15% of cases. But as already has been discussed, there is also implementation of other evidence-based therapies when you get to the ward for all these different conditions listed there. So back to the pathophysiology slide. So we've talked about fluid redistribution and renal changes, cardiac dysfunction, and the, uh, the neurohormonal activation. So new treatment strategies can be divided up into these different groups. So we have fluid redistribution, renal dysfunction, and we're going to look at niceratide, ularitide, and relaxin, cardiac dysfunction with sinusiguate, and omecamptive macabre, and neurohormonal activation with direct renin inhibition and non-steroidal uh, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists. So looking first to uh, fluid redistribution and renal changes. So looking at the natriuretic peptides, as, you, as we all know, uh, an, a stretched heart or overloaded heart releases BNP, and BNP is overall a very good molecule. It results in hemodynamic changes, including vasodilation, neural hormonal changes that are beneficial, renal changes, including diuresis and naturesis, and cardiac changes, including increased relaxation, anti-remodeling, and antifibrotic effects. So niceratide is a synthetic BNP. An early phase trial showed significant promise. We saw a reduction in dyspnea at three hours, but there was no reduction, oh, sorry, there was a concern with niceratide from a meta-analysis that it might have increase in death. So this was a meta-analysis of a number of trials which showed that there were 35 deaths in 485 patients on niceratide versus 15 on placebo with a risk ratio quite elevated 1.74 but didn't reach statistical significance. So it's just something to keep in the back of their minds when they did the next round of um, investigations which was a SEND HF. And so there was no reduction in early or longer term morbidity and mortality and there was a modest reduction in dyspnea at 30 days. So overall, this, this um, niceratide didn't do very well. And it's still in use in parts of the world, but in general its use has fallen out of favour. Sorry about this. Okay, so ularatide, uh, urodilantin is the next uh, molecule that we're going to have a look at. So urodilatin is uh, produced in the kidneys and ultimately binds to the NPRA receptor and it causes, in, which is in the collecting duct, and it causes uh, sodium and water excretion. So it, I think we've already looked at this trial, so just very briefly, there were 221 patients with ADHF, a low cardiac index and high pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. And it showed that there was um, a, this is placebo here, and this is the dose of 15 milligrams per kilogram per minute, and that there was there were statistically significant reductions in pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. And there was a lack of injury or renal decline with this um, drug, ularatide, 
and an increase in cardiac output without compromising the gradient across the kidney, the map to uh, right arterial gradient. So this drug is actually under phase three trials at the moment. It's true HF, so we'll see how that uh, turns out. So the next drug is relaxin, and it's a pregnancy-related hormone. It has all these effects, so vasorelaxation, increase in remodeling, decrease in fibrosis, increase in cell survival, increase in tissue healing, and decrease in inflammation. So this was the pre-relax trial, which was done in 234 patients. There was dyspnea relief and safety, which was optimal at the 30 microgram per kilogram per day. And they then went on to do the relax AHF trial. So this uh, was a so this was a trial which had patients with systolic blood pressure greater than 125 millimetres of mercury and they were hospitalised for acute heart failure defined as including all of the following at screening. So dyspnea at rest or with minimal exertion, pulmonary congestion by chest x-ray, a BNP greater than 350 or NT pro BNP greater than 1400. So they had to be randomised within 16 hours from hospital presentation and they had to receive IV brusamide of 40 milligrams or greater and have impaired renal function. So it was a phase three global randomised placebo controlled trial with a primary efficacy endpoint of dyspnea relief on day one and days one to five and a secondary efficacy endpoint of morbidity and mortality to day 60. So they had 1,100 patients enrolled starting in October 2009. And there was no significant effect on the co-primary endpoint, although an increase in the area under the curve for dyspnea at day five was seen. There was no significant effect on the secondary endpoint of uh, CV death and heart failure and renal rehospitalisation, but there was a suggestion of a decrease in the number of cardiovascular deaths, which was offset by an increase in the number of heart failure hospitalisations. So this, trial, this is actually continuing to be developed. Uh, there's a RELAX AHF2 trial which is underway. So the next one we're going to, uh, the next pathophysiological mechanism guiding treatment is the cardiac dysfunction. So the guanolate cyclase activation was looked at with a drug called Sinisiguat. So soluble guanolate cyclase activation is an essential step for nitric oxide pathway mediated vasodilation and mechanistically these drugs are quite similar to the nitrates and the development of this drug was halted due to severe hypotension so we won't be seeing that one around again. But another quite promising drug is omecamtiv macabal. So this is an inotropic like agent but it has a different mode of action with no known arrhythmogenic potential. So the mode of action is that it increases weak uh, to strong binding transition rate, increases the number of independent force generators or myosin heads interacting with the actin filament, and it increases the overall number of active cross bridges and has all of these effects listed here. So it prolongs the duration of systole potentially to the detriment of diastole. It increases stroke volume, no change in uh, DP TT max, no increase in MVO2, uh, no increase in heart rate, catecholamines, cyclic AMP or calcium transit, so hence it doesn't have the arrhythmogenic potential. So these were early stage, uh, this was a, the trials were done in 34 healthy volunteers and with this drug that showed an increase in systolic ejection time, ejection fraction, fractional shortening and stroke volume. And this was also done uh, at the same time as uh, another trial in mild heart failure, uh, which showed uh, improvements in systolic ejection time, stroke volume as demonstrated there. So they went on to do Atomic HF, which was a trial in 613 patients, which was phase two. It didn't reach its primary endpoint of dyspnea reduction, but demonstrated greater dyspnea relief in the third cohort, which was at the highest dose, which was associated with a modest increase in troponin. So this drug is continuing to be developed. And looking now to neurohormonal activation, uh, so the renin inhibitors, we've heard about it over the course of this um, Congress. So if we have uh, A2 antagonists or ACE inhibitors, there is renin escape, but if you block the renin much higher up here, there's potential to reduce that. And this was the astronaut study which looked at aliskarin at 300 milligrams versus placebo. 
and the outcomes were negative, so cardiovascular death, heart failure, rehospitalisation at six months, a non-significant reduction, and also some major issues with safety, so increased hyperkalemia, increased renal impairment or renal failure, and increased hypotension. So I don't think that drug's going very far. And lastly, we've got the non-steroidal mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist Bay 948862, which has become known as phenerenone. So spironolactone and aplerinone reduce total mortality, cardiovascular mortality, and heart failure hospitalizations in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. But they're underutilized due to a risk of hyperkalemia and renal dysfunction. And this compound is a non-steroidal mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist with improved selectivity for the mineralocorticoid receptor over other steroid hormone receptors compared with spironolactone. It has approved, improved affinity for the MR compared to aplerinone and greater cardiorenal end organ protection. And you can see from this that the structure is really quite different, spironolactone and aplerinone steroid hormone, uh, steroid uh, based uh, MRAs, whereas this is a totally different structure, it's a non-steroidal antagonist. ArtsHF has also been spoken about, but basically it was a phase two study looking at the safety and tolerability. This is the change in EGFR, this is placebo here, and we have spironolactone here. And with the increasing doses, there was a reduction in EGFR, but not as great as that seen with spironolactone. And if you're looking at plasma NT Pro BNP, this is the reduction seen with spironolactone. And these doses here have comparable reductions. So this is a very interesting um, medication which will be developed, continuing to be developed. So in summary, there are many new agents being studied in acute decompensated heart failure. Many agents look at novel ways to block old systems, for example, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Other agents look at new ways to block old targets, for example, myocardial contractile impairment. And still others are focused on treating the cardiorenal syndrome. And work is ongoing on chasing this elusive goal. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm.